Hello, everybody. Welcome to our CME conference for the week of March 23rd, 2022. Please remember to fill out an evaluation form, especially if you would like to receive CME credit. Today's lecture is entitled Treatments for Obesity. Our faculty name and affiliation is Dr. Kurt Hong. He is the Director, Center for Clinical Nutrition and Applied Health Research, Keck Hospital of USC. He's the Associate Professor of Clinical Medicine at the Keck School of Medicine of USC. Today's CME activity is not supported by any commercial interest. As part of the commercial guidelines, we are required to disclose if speakers have any affiliations or financial arrangements with any corporate organization relating to the presentation. Dr. Hong has nothing to disclose, and with that, I turn it over to Dr. Hong. Thank you. Um, it's a pleasure for me to be speaking uh, to the faculty here today uh, on a very important topic, which is the treatment and management of adult obesity. Uh, it's actually a very exciting time uh, in terms of looking at the new novel therapeutic that's available to healthcare providers, uh, particularly when it comes to not only medication options, but also surgical options that we can potentially provide for our patient. And what I'd like to do today is to give a quick overview of all these new medications that are now available to us. Before we talk about evaluation of uh, our overweight and obese patients in primary care setting, uh, I'd like to just address obviously a major problem which you are probably all aware of, which is the obesity uh, epidemic. Uh, this is probably a slide you've seen in multiple similar type of format in terms of looking at the increase in the number of patients where we are now seeing where their obesity is creating issues with uh, increased risk for uh, metabolic and chronic diseases. And this is not only something we see in both men and women, but in terms of adolescent and even pediatric obesity, it is something that is a big concern. Uh, particularly during the COVID pandemic, uh, we are seeing a lot of patients being uh, restricted, being at home uh, because of the increased stress level. And with all the gyms being closed, a decrease in the activity level. Uh, on average, the past two years, I've seen a lot of patients, they've actually put on 12 to 15 pounds. So even in your previously relatively healthy patient, now, because of the acute weight gain over this short period of time, we're seeing a lot more patients where they are running into problems of developing prediabetes or their blood pressure or even their joint diseases have become more obvious. Uh, and so this is something definitely you may want to address your patients uh, sooner rather than later. Uh, it goes without saying that uh, obesity is associated with quite a number of different diseases, and it goes beyond just metabolic diseases. We've always known that in patients who are either overweight or obese, uh, this is associated with the increased risk for diabetes, as well as cardiovascular disease, such as hypertension or dyslipidemia. But more and more, we're also recognizing the impact of obesity on mechanical diseases. Uh, we are seeing a lot of patients, because of their weight, they are actually having a lot of issues in terms of the hip problems or knee problems. And we're seeing patients where even if they have baseline chronic back disease, because they're gaining weight, they are now developing worsening symptoms as it relates to their sciatica. Uh, obstructive sleep apnea is actually considered a mechanical defect that tends to worsen uh, with obesity. And really the only treatment for patients with severe OSA is to lose weight. And in, in, in patients with severe obstructive sleep apnea, obviously this can also be associated with uh, poor daytime energy as well as worsening hypertensive control. But in addition to both mechanical as well as metabolic uh, kind of comorbidities that are associated with obesity, we also now recognize there are a number of psychologic issues uh, as well as other uh, metabolic and cancer risks that are associated with obesity, such as depression, worsening anxiety, uh, affected self-esteem, but there are specific type of cancer that there is a strong correlation with obesity, such as breast cancer, prostate cancer, as well as colon cancer. So if we're able to really manage the patient's weight problems and actually treat their obesity effectively, there are potentially just a lot of things that we can do, not only for our patients from a medical standpoint, but also to be able to provide the patients with an improved quality of life. What 
makes treatment of obesity sometimes very difficult is that, you know, the traditional thinking that obesity is really just a disease of poor self control has really been thrown out the window. Uh, we now recognize, yes, for a lot of patients, you know, they still need to pay attention to their nutrition, to their calorie, and definitely for your inactive patients, you know, we definitely want them to exercise, not just for their weight, but also for their mental health, as well as for their overall uh, immunity, as well as other health benefits. But there are multiple other variables that can actually determine somebody's weight. Uh, we are beginning to recognize there's something called the gut-brain axis in terms of how the stomach and the GI tract also communicate with the brain. And some of the dysregulation of some of the uh, gastrointestinal hormones can also contribute to obesity. And if you look at some of the newer generation medications that are being used in obesity management, it's used specifically to target, target the dysregulation of some of these gut hormones. But we also begin to regula, uh, recognize that there are specific genetic predispositions uh, that can actually cause patients to actually struggle with weight. Uh, we frequently will see family clusters where weight is an issue. You know, frequently if you ask them specifically about whether or not their parents or siblings are also overweight, a lot of these pa uh, patients may also tell you, you know, it definitely runs in the family. But there are also cultural as well as other social economic factors that can also impact whether or not somebody is more uh, effective in terms of achieving their weight loss progress as compared to other patients. You know, in terms of being able to financially afford certain type of food, uh, whether or not they're able to be in an environment that sets them up for success, these are all actually things that obviously would be something you may want to also assess when you first evaluate an obese patient. Now, we do recognize now beyond basically a hunger uh, center in the brain that regulates our hunger signal as well as our appetite or satiety signal, there's another part of the brain in the hypothalamus that can actually also regulate what we call the reward system. And this is something that's beginning uh, to really catch a lot of the scientists' attention. And if you look at the next generation of medication that are being developed and targeted, we are recognizing that, you know, if you talk to a lot of patients, you know, what sometimes will drive these patients to overeat? It's not purely due to hunger. And, you know, it's not all that... Uh, uncommon that a patient will tell us, you know what, I really don't get that hungry. But one of the things that I recognize is that if I'm having a bad day when it comes to overeating, it's really due to a lot of stress eating, you know, sometimes eating out of boredom, you know, sometimes just eating because even if they know exactly what they should do, it's still hard to walk away from food. And this is something that we are seeing a lot particularly now patients are being at home a lot more due to COVID. Uh, it's so much easier when you're working uh, virtually to be able to walk to the kitchen more often. And, you know, we see a lot of patients where they will just graze on food. So even if they know exactly how to plan their meals properly, if all of a sudden they're incorporating a lot more empty calories in between meals, this can become a problem. And this is where the mesolimbic reward system becomes important. Because if there are actually medications or cognitive behavioral therapy that specifically aim to target to better control this reward system, we're able to really able to work with the patient to be able to control their cravings. So this is basically just a slide to show why weight loss is so difficult to maintain long term. So this is just a quick study showing that if you actually are able to counsel the patient and come up with a good dietary plan for the patient, you know, with diet alone, most patients, uh, they were able to lose about 5 or 10 percent of their weight after about 6 to 12 months. Now, obviously, as you can see in this slide, if you are able to incorporate also additional exercise prescription in addition to dietary intervention, you are going to be able to get the patient to lose a little bit more weight. Now, if you look at majority of the weight loss trials, most people, they'll lose majority of their weight after the first six months. They will usually lose a little bit more weight between months seven through 12, but we do start to see people hit a little bit of plateau or they are able to basically start to regain some of that weight back. However, if you continue to track a lot of these patients long-term, many of the patients, unfortunately, 
unless they're still followed by their physician closely, eventually they will regain a big chunk of that weight back. And we do think there are a couple of reasons basically why this is so. Number one, it's hard to be compliant or pay attention to their diet and exercise regimen long term. So a lot of times people will become really, really strict and monitor their calories closely for that first three to six months. After a while, because something comes up or they get busy with their work, they kind of fall off the wagon. But there's also a physiologic component where if a patient's been at a certain higher weight for a while, anytime they lose weight, physiologically, their body naturally will want to fight back to get back to their original higher weight. So this is where it becomes really, really important to continue to monitor the patients closely. You know, just as if you may have a patient with hypertension, you definitely want to continue to monitor the patient's blood pressure control on a regular basis. You know, all too frequently where we see a lot of primary care physicians where they will work with their patients on the acute weight loss phase, but they frequently fail to monitor the patients as part of their weight maintenance phase. So ex again, as you can see this slide, it is really, really important to discuss your weight issues with your patients, particularly during their routine follow-up visits. So let's talk a little bit about treatment options beyond kind of just diet and exercise. So if you look back just about 10 years ago, definitely at that time, uh, you know, one of the things that sometimes can be used effectively is the use of meal replacements. And this would obviously be used uh, in place of lunch or dinner. Uh, there are certain centers uh, that will actually implement what they call very low calorie diet. We typically don't recommend this because there are some issues in terms of increased risk for electrolyte imbalance when you drop the patient's calorie count into the five, 600 calorie range. And typically as part of the very low calorie diet, sometimes people will go on the liquid regimen, but there are still quite a number of centers where they may implement this on a short-term basis just to kind of help the patient jumpstart the, the weight loss progress. Definitely, we want to kind of get the patients to exercise, and this should be a combination of both cardio aerobic as well as resistance training to make sure that they don't lose any muscle mass when the patient is losing weight. Now, about 10 years ago, there are really not a lot of medications that are available to patients. Uh, there are some older generation medications such as phenamine, which has been around since the 1950s and 60s. Uh, there was also a fat blocker or a lipase inhibitor called Orlistat that's still available on the market today. And that comes in two forms. Uh, one is the higher dose, which is 120 milligram that's available via prescription. And then there is an over-a-counter form, which is half a dose at 60 milligram, which basically the patients can get themselves. Again, both of these medications, they're not going to work particularly well unless the patient's also monitoring their caloric intake. Now, I remember about 10, 15 years ago, I remember, you know, driving along the freeways, you'll see a lot of billboards really pushing for lap bands. And that's really kind of has fallen out of favor the past five to 10 years, just because, you know, we do see a lot of patients where unfortunately they will regain the weight back if they've gotten lap bands because they are not getting regular adjustments with their surgeons. And the traditional room and white gastric bypass, which used to be done openly, uh, are now more often done laparoscopically. And the room and white gastric bypass is actually around since the 1960s and 70s. Now, looking at the treatment options uh, more recently, uh, as of 2021 and 2022, as you can see on this list here, there are a lot more things you can now offer the patients. And we'll definitely discuss all these things in a little bit more detail the rest of the presentation. Again, the first generation appetite suppressants are still available. And there are basically three, four other medications besides fentramine. And they all work by very similar mechanism. They are all stimulants. Now, back in the 1960s, the FDA only requires safety profile or studies to be done basically for three months. So in terms of the original FDA approval, they actually meant for three months. Now, subsequently, there are some retrospective studies that has been published showing that as long as you still monitor the patients closely for any potential side effect profile, they can probably be used a little bit longer. Most of my patients, they're really not on in no more than about six months. And part of the reason to stop it is not just that we don't have long-term data in terms of safety use of use, 
But a lot of these medications, a lot of patients will also develop tachyphylaxis or tolerance to the medication where after a while they just don't work. But there are still good options. Uh, most of these are not covered by insurance, but generally speaking, cash pricing, they are not very expensive. Again, the original oral stat or the fat blocker is still available for us to use. Now, since 2013, these are some of the newer generation agents that are now available as a prescription basis. There is a new medication uh, which combines fentramine, which has been reformulated with another medication, which many of you are probably familiar with, called topiramid. Uh, topiramid is a medication uh, a lot of neurologists will use uh, basically either for seizure disorders or actually for migraine prophylaxis. However, topiramid by itself as a weight loss regimen is not particularly useful, but when you use it in combination with fentramine, uh, it actually helps to augment the effect of fentramine as they work in synergy. So that's one combination that's now available. Another new combination that's been available is actually a combination of bupropion with another medication called naltrexone. Again, both of these medications have been around since the 1980s, but these are a little bit newer formulation of the medication. So the, in terms of the general side effect profile, they are a little bit cleaner. Bupropion is an antidepressant, but it's also used for smoking cessation. Now, Trexone is a medication that we frequently will use in terms of for narcotics as well as alcohol dependence or addiction. And the combination of these two tends to do really well, particularly for patients where their main issue is actually with cravings, where they definitely notice that they have trouble being able to walk away or say no to food. So again, this is a great combination where we also have seen really good success in a lot of our patient populations. Now, in about 2014, uh, this is where one of the diabetes medication got approval basically by the FDA for use, also specifically for obesity management in your non-diabetic patient. So liver glutide at lower doses are still used basically for diabetes. It goes by the brand name of Victoza. However, at the higher doses, it actually goes by a different brand name, which is actually called Sixenda. Uh, it's actually used for obesity management. Only basically last year, there's a newer generation GLP-1, uh, which is uh, basically a injectable similar to liraglutide, except for instead of having to do the injectable daily, now you get to use weekly injectable. Again, the semi-glutide basically, which is originally approved for diabetes, now also has uh, indication by the FDA for use in non-diabetic patients uh, specifically for obesity management. Now, the one thing which I will mention is that of all these medications, the only one that actually has gotten approval for use in adolescent patients is the liraglutide. All the other medications, they only gotten approval for use basically in adult patients, anybody over the age of 18. Now, there are some anecdotal published results. As long as they're adolescent and you're monitoring them closely, it is up to your discretion, particularly in your significantly overweight and obese uh, teenagers, whether or not you may want to consider some of the other medications. Now, jumping over to uh, bariatric options, uh, there are definitely still some patients who are getting the rule and white gastric bypass. However, almost exclusively, unless there are obvious contraindications, most of these bypasses are now done through laparoscopic measures. However, majority of patients who are now looking to bariatric options, they are actually not getting the bypass. They're actually now getting something called a gastric sleeve or sleep gastrectomy. And we're going to talk about this a little bit later. And the reason for the preference for sleep gastrectomy is the generally overall better safety profile, yet you get somewhat similar, basically long-term benefit in terms of the amount of weight loss you're able to achieve. There are still some centers that are uh, offering adjustable gastric banding, but again, there are very, very few patients who are actually choosing this route, just because now we have better medication options and there are also much better surgical options. Now, I'm not going to spend too much time on some of the other even newer endoscopic bariatric therapy options. Uh, I'm going to mention some of the, uh, these up here. Some of these are either done directly uh, by the surgeon or actually done by the uh, gastroenterologist who are trained to do these procedures. 
there are a number of intragastric balloons that you can actually insert to the patient, insert into the patient, and some of these are either fluid fill or gas fill. And the whole concept is by occupying the amount of space in the stomach, people can actually get full a little bit quicker. Again, the general amount of weight loss we see in this is usually about five or 10% of the weight, which is really not all that different than some of the newer generation medications. There's even a new device out called the Aspire Assist device. Think of this as almost like a G-tube uh, where the patient can actually just drain their stomach content after they eat so it doesn't get into their small intestine so there's no chance for the body to absorb these content. The problem with this device is, again, this is almost gives the patient a way to cheat without really focusing on their uh, uh, changing their eating habits. Again, uh, it's not uh, particularly super effective, and this is, again, something that most patients uh, do not look at as a common option uh, that they would consider. The one thing which we do see a lot more patients looking into this uh, as an option is the endoscopic sleep gastroplasty. Uh, so think of this as a endoscopic version of the sleep gastrectomy, except for this is actually done internally by a gastroenterologist. So instead of doing this as a surgery where they actually will make a permanent sleeve of the stomach by cutting out a significant portion of the stomach, in this case, uh, through endoscopic route, they actually put in sutures from the inside to seal off a significant portion of the stomach, and as such, you actually create a much smaller sleeve or volume within the stomach. And again, I'm going to show some of the pictures here. And the newest uh, player on the market, which is actually considered a device, even though the patient would actually take this, is actually something called Plenity or uh, it's a cellulose gel cap, actually people will actually swallow. Uh, and think of this as something that's not absorbed by the body. And when you mix cellulose with water, you actually expand. So you actually will take this three times a day before your meal. And when it expands, uh, again, it actually occupies the space. And the hope is, again, the patients will eat less. So just a couple of pictures here showing either a single or dual balloon that will occupy the stomach space. Uh, again, these will be, can be removed, uh, as well as a drainage device, which needs to be surgically put in. Again, after the meal, uh, the patient actually will drain the stomach content. Uh, again, comparing the sleep gastrectomy where uh, the, the part of the stomach is permanently removed uh, to create this small sleeve here. In this case, uh, this, is, uh, this is done endoscopically where sutures are strategically placed to seal off that part of stomach. And because these are sutures, if for some reason it's needed, this is actually considered a reversible procedure. Uh, and again, uh, uh, this is the cellulose gel cap, which we are ingested, uh, creating a transient space occupying uh, capacity or as such, it's considered a device. So let's next talk a little bit about how you can better assess uh, your patients in the office setting. So in terms of looking at uh, basically the overweight obese patient, you know, without question, you know, while sometimes we'll take advantage of medication, it is still important to make sure that patients are making adequate uh, lifestyle changes. You know, you don't want patients to feel like the medication is the cure-all. Definitely the patient still needs to eat healthier. They still need to pay attention to their exercise as well as their caloric intake. And for some patients, they may even uh, benefit from working with a therapist uh, specifically just to make sure that they are not dealing with a lot of depression or anxiety related overeating. Uh, but for a lot of patients where diet and exercise uh, is just not enough, uh, it's great to have medication options. And definitely for patients who qualify because of, based off of their BMI or because of their BMI comorbidity, the surgical options are definitely in play. And for a lot of patients, even if they actually uh, uh, have surgery, but they continue to have significant hunger or they hit a weight plateau before they get all the way down to their target weight, you can definitely still consider a combination with use of medications. 
And definitely every step of the way, you want to continue to determine the degree of BC and assess their comorbidities. So the first thing you need to do is to calculate the patient's BMI. Uh, obviously, you probably are very well aware the healthy weight is considered BMI between 18 to 25. Overweight is anybody be, uh, above BMI of 25 to 30. Uh, and it's been estimated if you look at the U.S. population as whole. Uh, in terms of the number of patients who are either overweight or obese, anybody pretty much over the BMI of 25, it's close to 68 to 70 percent of the population. So pretty much two out of every three patients that's walking in the door, a lot of them, they can really benefit from some weight loss therapy. Once you get above BMI of 30, you are considered to be obese. Once you get above BMI of 35, you are considered to be eligible potentially for surgery, particularly if you have a comorbidity. If you get above BMI of 40, you are considered to be morbid, obese. And if you get above BMI of 60, there's actually a term called super morbid obese. And unfortunately, we do see a fair share of patients where their BMI is above 60. So in addition to making sure that the patients get their blood pressure, their vitals in their office, definitely now with the use of EHR, a lot of times you should be able to look at the patient's BMI because they're auto-calculated based on their weight as well as their height. Now, obviously, anytime we're looking at weight, we definitely want to look at comorbidities, such as whether or not the patient also has hyperlipidemia as well as diabetes or even sleep apnea and fatty liver disease, as well as degenerative joint uh, discomfort with uh, the hips, back, or the knee are also considered to be comorbidities. And definitely, you know, this is the one time where you will really want to gauge the patient's readiness to really tackle their weight problem. Now, the problem with the BMI is in some patients, particularly in your geriatric population and patients, imagine if they are somebody where they're not necessarily significantly overweight, but they really are not eating well and they don't exercise regularly, they can actually have something what we call sarcopenic obesity. So you have a patient where their BMI is 24, but because they have very little lean muscle mass, they may weigh only 125 pounds, but they're only 80 pounds of muscle. They actually carry 45 pounds of body fat. So their percent body fat is actually still very, very high. And as such, they actually still are at pretty high risk for diabetes and heart disease. And if you purely look at the BMI, you can actually miss this higher risk population of patients. Now, on the flip side of the coin, you actually will see some really young athletes where they may weigh 200 pounds, but they're actually 18% body fat because they have a huge amount of muscle. So more and more, we're actually seeing offices where they're actually carrying around body composition machine just so that we can get a little bit more information. And the beauty of the bioimpedance analysis of the body composition machine, and this is the machine, for instance, we have at our center, is it gives us the breakdown of their weight. You know, how much of their current weight is truly muscle versus body fat? So you can actually look at the BMI with a much better context. Uh, you can then calculate their percent body fat, and more importantly, actually will also give us the estimation of their metabolic rate. So somebody with a metabolic rate of 1,200 versus 80, uh, 1,800 calories or even higher, in terms of their caloric intake to be able to lose weight, it will then allow you to really personalize the diet a little bit more for them. So one of the questions people often will ask is, well, you know, there are all sorts of diet out there. You know, there are these super low carb diet and there are certain diets out there where they focus on cutting out mostly of the dietary fat. There are some of the diet that's more balanced and just about every week there seems to be a new diet coming out. Uh, are there really certain type of diets that are just more efficacious in terms of inducing weight loss more than others? So there was a great uh, study that was basically published. And this was a meta-analysis based off of a lot of the smaller studies. And this was published in JAMA about seven, eight years ago, comparing the different types of diet. And this is just kind of a quick summary. And what they did is they grouped the diets into three major classes. Uh, they consider them either low-carb, 
moderate macronutrients or they're more balanced in terms of the carb to the fat to the protein ratio, or they are focused more on the low fat, such as the Ornish diet. And what they found out, and this was actually a relatively big meta-analysis looking at oh, actually over 7,000 patients, is that the largest weight loss were seen in both the low carb as well as the low fat diets. However, if you look at the data, both of them were very similar. So low carb is not necessarily better than low fat. It's also kind of based off the patient's preference in terms of what's doable for them. Now, between, let's just say, the two different types of low carb, let's just say somebody wants to know, is there a difference between Atkins diet versus compared to the zone diet? They're actually very, very similar. So ultimately, it is going to be important in terms from a compliance standpoint to talk to the patient to see whether or not there is something that they prefer over another, or if one, based off of their comorbidity, one thing may be better than another. So for instance, if you have a patient with significant cardiovascular disease, you may not necessarily want to do a low carb diet where they now actually are consuming a lot more dietary fat. For them, a low fat diet, a low fat diet may actually be something that may be more appropriate. So in the next section here, I like to just talk a little bit more about the specific details of the pharmaceutical therapies. So part of the reason why you have to look at the BMI is it actually will then allow you to determine whether or not based off of their insurance coverage or based off of the guidelines, the patient actually will qualify for pharmacotherapy. So again, for anybody who is overweight, BMI above 25, definitely you want to talk about diet and exercise with the patient. Now, it doesn't take very much for the patient to get their BMI above 27. And as long as the patient has failed diet and exercise, and as long as they have a comorbidity, and the list for comorbidity is pretty exhaustive. Uh, again, it could be any of the metabolic comorbidities we talked about. It could be any of the mechanical comorbidities we talk about then they actually will qualify for pharmacotherapy. Now, once their BMI gets above 30, which gets them into the uh, obesity range, they don't even necessarily need to have a comorbidity to be considered for pharmacotherapy. Uh, for patients who are looking into endoscopic bariatric therapy, such as endoscopic gastroplasty, uh, their BMI basically sounds they're above 30 with a comorbidity, they will qualify. As we talked about before for surgery, as long as their BMI is 35 with comorbidity, they would qualify. And once their BMI is above 40, again, they don't even need a comorbidity to qualify for sleeve gastrectomy. Now, there are definitely certain medications that doesn't necessarily directly increase the patient's weight, but can make weight loss a little bit more difficult. Uh, for patients who are on some of the older generation antidepressants, such as a tricyclic, uh, for patients who are on combination of high dose SSRIs, for some of the patients on some of the atypical and uh, antipsychotics, uh, you know, an example for this is something like uh, Abilify can cause weight gain in some patients. For patients who are on lithium as well as some of the anti-seizure medications, they can definitely make the weight loss process a little bit more difficult. Some of the older generation beta blockers can actually impact your body's metabolism, but generally not the newer generation beta blockers. Uh, definitely some of the diabetes medications in addition can actually induce weight gain. The biggest one is definitely insulin. Uh, one of the most common thing we see is you have some patients who are on oral medications. The second they transition to insulin regimen, frequently within the first six to 12 months, they actually will gain some weight, which unfortunately makes their glycemic control even worse. Uh, sulfonylureas can definitely also increase a little bit of the weight gain. Unlike some of the old, uh, newer generation medications, such as the GLP-1s, such as liraglutide or semiglutide, which in those cases actually help with weight loss. HIV medications, uh, in addition to causing uh, lipodystrophy, can also independently cause weight gain. So that's also something to consider. Uh, some of the medications we use for breast cancer, specifically tamoxifen, uh, can also be associated with weight gain in some patients. And definitely for patients who are on steroids, either for autoimmune diseases or, or for asthma, 
Uh, definitely, and uh, we've actually even seen use of glucose uh, steroids for treatment, basically for COVID, that has actually secondarily resulted in weight gain in patients. So this is just a quick overview again of all the current anti-OPC drugs currently on the market. Uh, again, I grouped them into a couple of big sections. The top four or five medications are all the older generation medication. As you can see, it still makes up a big chunk of the market. And a big part of it is just because of the cost. So if you look at basically the cost of the original and uh, appetite suppressants, uh, cash pricing, they're all about $25, $30, so about a dollar a day. Uh, again, there are still a lot of patients where if they don't have any obvious contraindication, there are still good options for patients, particularly if they don't have any significant history of heart disease or they don't have significant history of anxiety. Now, if you look at some of the newer generation medications, definitely without question, the efficacy is a little bit better in terms of the amount of weight loss achieved but if you look at the cost, again, the insurance coverage will really vary. But I put down the cash pricing here. Uh, both the phenamine topiramate combination as well as the bupropion and naltrexone combination, they used to be a lot more expensive. But more recently, they've dropped the price quite a bit. So right now, they are looking at about $3 a day or about 100 bucks a month. Both the liraglutide as well as semi-glutide, they are a lot more expensive. So they do need to be covered by insurance. Uh, and as long as you document properly, uh, we do find that more and more insurance companies, they are paying for these medications just because otherwise their cost is pretty prohibitive. So again, just a little bit more detail on the older generation stimulant. Uh, again, besides basically their short-term efficacy as well as short-term safety, uh, most people, they will only lose about 5 to 6% of their weight. Uh, but the good news is that the hope is by then they're able to then maintain their weight loss. So for some patients where they don't need to lose a lot of weight, uh, again, without any contraindications, uh, this can be considered. One of the biggest problems with these stimulants is you do need to monitor for any changes in blood pressure. You need to make sure that they don't have trouble with uh, insomnia, uh, as well as basically any issues with anxiety. Uh, very, very rarely, basically, they can cause valvular heart disease, but generally, if patients have any type of significant cardiovascular, structural heart disease, I would avoid the use of these medications. Uh, definitely for anybody with history of uncontrolled hyperthyroidism or uncontrolled glaucoma, this would not be the right medication for the patients. Uh, Orlistat is a fat blocker. Again, there are two forms, the prescription form, which is uh, 120 milligrams three times a day before meals, or the over-the-counter form, which is 60 milligrams. Uh, the achieved weight loss is, again, somewhere between about 5 to 8 uh, percent. It is a medication that I most I don't know too many physicians are actually using it actively uh, for a simple reason what is because we do see some GI side effect. But there may still be some patients where they would like to try it. Because this works by blocking the absorption of the dietary fat, uh, most of the effect tend to be associated with GI upsets. We do see pretty significant diarrhea as well as basically some bloating. And because of the block in dietary fat and the dumping of the dietary fat into the colon, and remember your colon can really mainly absorb only water. Sometimes people can have a little bit of spotting and fecal incontinence, which for a lot of patients are obviously not very uh, convenient. So this is something, again, you have to kind of take it case by case on whether or not this is the right medication for your patient. This is basically a little bit more information on the fentermine as well as the topiramate combination. This comes in four doses. Uh, you titrate all the way from 23 all the way up to 92 milligrams of topiramate. And the fentermine component, you titrate from 3.7 all the way up to 15 milligrams of fentermine. So unlike the phenamine alone, where you only get about a 5 to 6% weight loss, with this combination, you almost double the weight loss. So if you look at basically the weight loss here, you're almost able to achieve double digits, about 10 to 11%. 
Not surprisingly, most of the weight loss occurred during the first six months. However, because these are newer clinical trials, they actually follow the patient not only up to one year, but up to two years. And for patients where they continue to take the medication for the duration of the two years, they continue to be more successfully able to maintain their weight. But this also provides long-term safety data as compared to some of the older generation of medications alone. Not surprisingly, when the patients lose significant amount of weight, a lot of their metabolic parameters also improve. If you look at the improvement in their blood pressure, in their lipid profile, as well as in some of the in inflammatory markers, they all get better because of the associated weight loss. This is showing, again, improvement in insulin sensitivity with weight loss. Now, in terms of the side effect profile, uh, because this is a combination of two medications, the side effect profile is really just the side effect profile we expect to see from the individual component of the medication. So for the phenamine, again, you definitely want to make sure that the patients have uh, stable blood pressure and does not affect their sleep or anxiety. For topiramid, the general side effect sometimes we will see is basically paresthesia. Sometimes people may notice a little bit tingling in their hands or feet as well as fatigue. But because they come in four doses, what we typically will do, we'll start the patients at the lowest dose, and as long as the patients are able to tolerate these medications well, once every few weeks or once every month, then we slowly titrate up the, to the therapeutic dose. Now, the next combination that was approved is the naltrexone and the bupropion combination. Again, this is the one I generally like to use a little bit more, particularly for patients where cravings rather than true hunger is the major factor that prevent them from being able to stick to the diet a little bit easier. And this was just a published study showing, again, uh, the long-term benefit of the weight loss after a year. Uh, again, here you can see basically patients are able to lose about 8% of the weight. There was another study that was uh, published that showed that if you actually couple this with actually more aggressive dietary intervention, you can get close to, again, 10 or 11% of the weight loss. Uh, and one of the really interesting thing that basically goes into controlling their cravings is that there was a questionnaire survey as part of the clinical trial that asked the patient when they compared the patient population that was taking the combination as compared to the placebo, the patient generally reported that they were able to better control their eating have, and have less cravings and hence are able to stick with the diet a lot more. Uh, uh, as compared to those patients who were on the placebo treatment arm. Looking at the side effect profile, again, it just is the side effect profile you expect to see when you patients are either on the bupropion or on the naltrexone alone. I would say probably the most common side effect you see is nausea, which is mainly attributed to the naltrexone. Now, the good news is, again, this combination actually comes in four different dosings and very similar to the topiramid phenamine combination. I will start people at the lowest dose for the first week, and if they don't have any nausea, we can slowly ramp up the dose uh, up to four tablets a day, starting with one tablet a day, uh, just so that we can kind of get their body acclimated to the side effect before we slowly ramp up to avoid the risk for nausea. Uh, there are some patients who will notice a little bit of headaches as well as dizziness, as well as constipation. And all those other side effects are probably due more to the anticholinergic effect from the bupropion. Now, the last two medications, which I'm going to clump them into the same class, are the GLP-1 receptor agonists, which are also used for diabetes. The liraglutide uh, was approved in 2010 for type 2 diabetes, and the dosing for diabetes actually only goes up to 1.8 milligrams per day. You probably all know that by the brand name Victoza. Uh, it was approved for obesity management even for non-diabetic patients. Uh, it goes by a different brand name called Saxenda, and the dosing actually goes much higher just because it's typically needed to go to a higher dose to get significant weight loss. 
Uh, and again, this is the only one that's also approved for obesity management in adolescents between age 12 to 17, just a couple of years ago. One thing of note, probably the biggest hindrance for the liraglutide is this is a daily injection. So for some patients where they are, they get a little bit queasy with the injectables, even though they are not particularly hard to inject, this is something obviously you need to discuss with your patient. The newer kit on the market is something called semi-glutide. Uh, the brand name for diabetes is called Ozempic, which is again used at the lower dose, which goes up to one milligram. And in this case is one milligram per week. Uh, the higher dose, which was approved for obesity management, which goes up to 2.4 milligrams per week, was just approved again for adults in summer of last year. It goes by the brand name Wegovy. So sometimes patients will get confused because they see a TV ad for Wegovy, uh, and some of them they may also already be on Ozempic because they're also a diabetic patient, but they're exactly the same medication, but they're just titrated up to different doses. There are some studies showing that unlike the other traditional weight loss medications, uh, the GLP-1 receptor agonist, they also may provide additional benefits such as improved cardiovascular function, as well as basically other endocrine benefits such as improving insulin sensitivity. And this is not surprising just because it's also used in the treatment of diabetes. So this is a slide just showing that the mechanism of action of GLPR really works at the level of the gut rather than in the brain. So in part, it actually helps with insulin secretion from the pancreas and hence allow your uh, diabetic patient to have blood, uh, better blood sugar control. But by also slowing down the gastric emptying, it actually allows the patient to get a little bit full quicker. And we do think that it plays a major role in terms of inducing the weight loss benefits. But if you look at, again, some of the other mechanism of action, uh, it also has been shown to help with blood pressure and additional anti-inflammatory benefits, as well as some of the cardiovascular protection. This is basically just a slide showing the, the different dosing of the liraglutide, and hence the reason why they titrate all the way up to 3.0, because that's where you see the most of the, or the maximum weight loss. There are a couple absolute contraindications for lyric glutide. Uh, anybody with a history of pancreatitis, they cannot be on this class of medication. Uh, definitely anybody with a history of medullary thyroid cancer cannot be on this medication because uh, it has a very, very small risk for inducing pancreatitis. And thus, if they already have a history of pancreatitis, they would not be a good candidate for this. Uh, some of the side effects, probably the most common one is nausea. So it's very, very similar to the uh, bupropion naltrexone combination. Uh, and there are some patients who can also notice some constipation as well as GI bloating. So the side effect profile for both the liraglutide as well as the semiglutide, because they come from similar classes of medication, are very, very similar. This again is actually specifically data showing the effect of the semi-glutide. Uh, and again, it's really impressive to see now we're able to get close to 15% of the weight loss at the maximum dose of the semi-glutide once they're able to get up to the 2.4 weekly injection dosing. So in the last couple of minutes here, I'd like to talk a little bit about bariatric surgery. Again, definitely for patients where they need to lose a big part of their weight, particularly for patients where not only are they morbidly obese, but they actually have brittle or labile diabetes, surgery without a question will allow them the biggest success long term in terms of not only losing weight, but actually keeping the weight off. Uh, and more and more, almost all the insurance companies, as long as they meet the criteria, will cover for surgery. So again, these are the surgical options. I'm not going to talk about the lap band, but in terms of the difference between rural white gastric bypass and sleep gastrectomy, remember the rural white gastric bypass is a two-part procedure. It is a part procedure where, again, they make a small pouch of the stomach. So this is the restrictive component of the surgery, but they also is a malabsorptive component where they actually bypass the proximal aspect of your small intestines which is the absorptive component. And actually, this is where they actually will loop up 
the distal part of the small intestines into the pouch that they made. Unfortunately, as a result of this, you know, we do see patients where they are now at higher risk for malabsorption, particularly for their vitamins and minerals, and hence the reason why more and more uh, most of the surgeons, they're actually doing the sleep gastrectomy because as you can see on here, the major difference here is the, with the sleep gastrectomy, there is still the restrictive component of the surgery without the malabsorptive component. Again, basically, this is a better picture here showing the, the Y loop, again, connecting basically uh, the distal part of the small, uh, small intestine directly into the pouch that's made, bypassing the proximal aspect of the small intestines. We see significant weight loss, basically, uh, after a wide gastric bypass, a lot of people, they can lose close to 50 or 60% of their excess body weight after the first three years. Uh, and usually people have really good success as compared to just diet or medication alone in terms of long-term weight maintenance. Now, obviously, there are going to be patients where, unfortunately, they will regain some of the weight back. But definitely, even for patients with surgery, we will still want to monitor the patient's progress long-term. For patients where they've gotten a root and white gastric bypass, we do need to monitor their vitamin and mineral levels very closely. So for a lot of these patients, uh, even if they've been more than 10, 20 years out from their gastric bypass, you do need to run these blood tests at least once a year. In terms of checking their iron, B12, as well as folic acid uh, and zinc level, in addition to some of the fat soluble vitamins, such as vitamin A, E, and vitamin D. For the vertical sleeve gastrectomy, again, the beauty is there's no bypass and this is just actually just made out of the sleeve. So as compared to the traditional bypass where typically patients will be in the hospital for about four or five days, most patients only need to stay in the hospital for one or two days after the sleep gastrectomy, since this is also typically done laparoscopically. And if you actually look at the uh, amount of weight loss, it's really not that different than the uh, traditional rural white gastric bypass. And because of the shorter hospitalization stays, as well as lower risk for uh, micronutritional malabsorption, this is really the procedure, unless there's obvious contraindications to getting this. Probably the biggest contraindication to sleep gastrectomy is in patients with severe reflux disease, because this is the one case where after sleep gastrectomy, the reflux can actually be a little bit worse. So in that population patient, the root and white gastric bypass may be a viable option. So these are some of the common blood tests we actually will order for the patient the first year after surgery and then annually. Definitely we want to look at their blood count and their electrolytes and as well as a lot of their vitamin and mineral levels. And for many of these patients, uh, for both the rural white gastric bypass as well as sleep gastrectomy, the surgeons will put them on usually a multivitamin, a vitamin D supplement. Uh, and if they have documented iron deficiency or zinc deficiency, they may actually need to go on specific supplementation as well. Now, the one thing that's really, really important is because the patients will be losing weight very quickly, it is really important to address protein malnutrition, which means the first six months after the surgery, in addition to making sure that they're eating appropriately, a lot of these patients may be on a protein shake just to make sure when they're losing weight, they're not losing any lean muscle weight. And for patients where they continue to still have some hunger after surgery, pharmacotherapy may still be an option after surgery. So I'm not going to spend too much time here. Uh, there are a lot of current medications that are still being studied, and they are currently in clinical different phases of the clinical trial. Obviously, the obesity epidemic is not going away anytime soon, and I expect basically some of these medications actually will be hitting the market over the next two to five years. So this is the last slide here. Uh, again, when you evaluate a patient, really it's important to come up with a practical goal. 
see whether or not the patient's really ready to work with you closely to come up with a plan to make sure that they're able to get that consistent progress rather than look at this as just as a quick diet where it's not really addressing their health issue, but they're looking at it purely from a scale standpoint. Uh, if you feel like you're able to kind of get a body composition machine for your practice, I do think it offers a lot more information rather than just looking at the BMI. And definitely you want to still make sure that the patients focus on the diet and exercise beyond just potential medication options. But when appropriate, both pharmacotherapy as well as surgery may be useful. And I think one thing that's also exciting is that there are a lot of studies looking at the use of other types of diet, including intermittent fasting, potentially for weight management as well as other aspects of metabolic health. Now, I think the jury is still out whether or not that's something that may work better than the traditional diet, but I think it's exciting to know that there are other options out there now. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Hong, for your presentation today. Uh, if there are any questions for Dr. Hong, you can forward them directly to me. I will make sure he receives them. Uh, just a reminder to fill out your evaluation forms if you would like to receive CME credit. Thank you, everybody, and have a great day.